you join us for part five in our Philippians series entitled A Life Worth Living. A life worth living revolves around Jesus. That's what we're learning. And today the, the title of my message is Love Abounding. Love Abounding. I guess the question is though, what is love? Many people will have different views. When we just say love, love, all you need is love, what does that mean? It's a phrase that's really lost its meaning. It's kind of a platitude. It means uh, do what you like, really. Do whatever you want to do as long as it feels good. The problem with that kind of love is it actually, although it may make you feel happy and uh, may give you some temporary joy, the reality is we end up hurting a lot of other people around us when we live out a worldly kind of love. So we're going to look, a life worth living needs to be abounding in love, but we're going to see that that love must be taught and shaped by God, by principally who Jesus is. A life revolves around Jesus, you see. Jesus, the God who laid his life down for those who don't deserve it. That's what love is, laying your life down for someone else, particularly those who don't deserve it particularly for those who have offended you, who have sinned against you, laying your life down for them. That's the Christ-like, Christian sort of love that we need to be abounding in. And we'll find that that brings goodness to others and it brings joy to us as we give ourselves away like that. Love abounding. And the, the, the point of this message is we must be filled with God's kind of love if we are to live God's kind of life. Philippians 1, 9 to 11 says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure, blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. First thing I want us to notice is that prayer is important. This is my prayer. Paul has been thanking God for what he's for the for what he's seeing in this church. Now he's seeing love. A couple of weeks ago we talked about partnership or fellowship, loving each other working together, serving God together, they're doing well. They're a great church. They are loving each other. They are in partnership. But what we thank God for, we also want to see more of. So it's great to thank God. We must do that. But then we must pray for more of it. And that's what he's doing here. And this is my prayer. That, my, that your love may abound more and more. He wants, praying is important. If we want to see a church that's abounding in love, we must pray for that church. If we want to see a Christian, or if you yourself want to love more, because I know I'm selfish, I get angry, I can, I can get, get in a mood, I can be unforg- find it hard to forgive. Very self-centred. Sometimes. Sometimes I can look in on myself and say, Matt, why are you acting like that? Stop it. And I almost have an argument with myself. You have that feeling sometimes, you look, you're looking at yourself thinking, what a wally. Because we're not perfect. Thank, thank God he forgives us. Thank God we've also made progress. You're not what you were, are you? But we need to pray for love to abound more and more. This is important to pray. Pray. If you've got somebody you think, you know what, I'd love to see more of the love of God in them, pray. It begins with that. So prayer is important. Love is to abound. This is my prayer that your love may abound. That word abound, Paul loves to use it. 26 of the 39 occurrences of this word abound in the New Testament are by the Apostle Paul. This idea of overflowing. Love is like a force. 
Love is a force. When we talk about love, it's a force coming out of us that's affecting things around us. I have here a watering can. It's a bit pathetic. I talk about abounding, this little watering can, but you know, it's the best I can do. Really, I should have a power hose or something or a great big dam that breaks open or something. But hey, I've got a watering can. Love abounding. As we pour the love of God into us, then the love of God pours out of us. We must be filled with God's kind of love if we are to live God's kind of life. We are to abound, overflow in love. As water is poured in, the water of God's love is poured into our lives, it can pour out into others. The life that God wants for us, affecting and loving other people. So he wants their love to abound, to overflow. Love isn't just something we receive from God. Oh, Lord, I thank you for loving me. And then it stays there and we get on with our lives. No, it's the love of God is to over then over, abound, overflow, break out from our lives. But Paul says something interesting here. He wants their love to abound in knowledge. Abound in knowledge. Now, I do a bit of gardening. I'm not very good at it, but I do have a few plants. And what you must do is you must water it, but you must also feed your plants. And I've got here some fertilizer here. He wants their love to abound in knowledge. He wants the love that they have to be informed by knowledge. You've got, you've got to get some knowledge in there, otherwise your love can go haywire. We all, uh, all know about maybe spoiled children. It's not because their parents don't love them, is it? It's because their love has gone slightly off track. We can love people and hurt them, can't we? We can overindulge. We can, we can think we love someone having an affair. We can think we love this thing when it's actually going to hurt us. Love needs to be fertilised, as it were, with knowledge. So I, I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge. In knowledge. It's got to be filled with knowledge. We've got to... Look at Jesus Christ, as it, we're taught to in the book of Philippians. We're to look at the whole of scripture, actually, learn about who God is. This is knowledge of God and his ways. And it's this, this word epignosis, this, word, this knowledge, is about an experiential knowledge. It's about personally knowing Jesus Christ, experiencing his love. It's when we read about him, we learn from his word, it's about us owning that truth, believing that truth. It's not just an academic idea, it's the God of the Bible is our God, my God. So he prays that their love would abound with knowledge in the things of God. As we read the whole of scripture, but particularly looking at the person of Christ, our, no our love will abound but it will be the right kind of love that's going to bring health to ourselves and to other people. In Romans 5, 8, Paul says this, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Paul, whenever he talks about Jesus, he's always really not only saying how we're how we're saved, how we're forgiven, but it's also about how we are to now live in light of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he's demonstrated and shown us that what love is. He's given us this knowledge. God so loved the world. Let that get into you. Let your love be informed by the gospel. Knowledge, the truth, knowledge of God and his ways are to shape our love. And he also says your love may abound more and more, not only in knowledge, but also depth of insight. 
This is about knowing the right course of action. It's like wisdom. It's the application of truth. It's thinking in light of, of God, knowledge of God. How, what's the right course? What's the right thing to do? Is it, is it this? Is it that? Making good moral decisions based upon knowledge. And we need to think about the decisions we make. Not just emotional response. Often love is emotional, isn't it? How do, I, how do I feel? The fire. How do I feel in my heart? We need to learn to make good decisions. That's loving. Depth of insight. Knowing leads to living. And then, and this is the, the second form of, here we are, I've got this pink, um, I think it's for orchids. The second kind of a fertilizer to put into our love. Our love is to abound in knowledge, know, the knowledge of God, the things of God, who he is from his words, and depth of insight. That's then, as a result of knowledge, making good decisions. Our love is to overflow from our lives. And it says here, so that you may be able to discern what is best, may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruits of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now these terms, all of these terms, kind of overlap, don't they? Discerning what is best, very much links to the, 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 the previous term, depth of insight. But this is when the rubber hits the road. You've, you've got knowledge of the things of God, you therefore discern what is the be best way to go, now you actually do it so that you may be able to. Now get on with it. Make good decisions. Make good moral choices. What is best? And he uses these terms, pure and blameless. Pure is about inner motivations. Blameless is about how this looks to other people around us. Our lives are to be pure. We're to do things. The love of God is to, do, is to create in us a purity within us and a blameless life, an exemplary life to those around us, filled with the fruit of righteousness. As we, as we overflow this love overflows, there is a growth and a fruit of righteousness in us and around us. It's like a garden, a healthy garden around us because we are loving correctly to the glory and praise of God. Our lives bring glory to God. Our lives bring praise to God when we love, when our love is shaped by knowledge and depth of insight rather than foolishness. And this idea is, it, here is not about, shall I do, you know, shall, this obvious sin, shall I do it or not? No, this is about discerning what is best, you know? There are not commandments, are there, over how much TV to watch? There are not commandments over how much, how much time to spend on the internet or Facebook. or There are so many things in life that are not commanded. Now, of course, we're to love God and we're to love others. But that leaves a lot of room, doesn't it? And so we need to prayerfully love. We need to do what's excellent based upon knowledge and depth of insight, discerning what is best, choosing what is best, making the best choices. You know, there are all sorts of choices, but is that the best choice? Have you, having prayed about it, having thought about the ways of God, having sought him for leading, are you making the best choice 
Not just, uh, is it okay? Does the Bible say I can or can't? Is it the best choice? Does it really bring glory to God? Does it serve the purposes of God in your life? Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, the whole art of life, I sometimes think, is the art of knowing what to leave out, what to ignore, what to put on one side. Shall I take that job? Oh, it requires more commuting. It requires more time. How's that going to affect your life? Weigh it up. Is it best? Shall I start that relationship with that person? Okay, they go to church. Is it best? Is that person going to cause your love for Jesus to be fanned into flame? Or is it, you know, they go to church. Is your love being filled, informed and shaped by knowledge and then depth of insight and then you are proving what is best? Shall I watch that film? The Bible doesn't say I can't watch that film. Shall I listen to that music? The Bible doesn't say I can't listen to that music. The question is, does it bring praise and glory to God? Does it help your relationship with God? Does it help your inner purity? Does it, is it blameless? Do people look at your behaviour and say, wow, that brings glory to God? Now, these are things that you need to seek God for and seek to live that kind of loving life. You know, Paul said this to the Corinthians, and the Corinthians were in all sorts of, 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 of a mess. And he, he wrote to them, and he's thankful to God for them, and he's, he's trying to help them in their, in their problems. And he says this, he quotes them, I have the right to do anything, you say. He says to them, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, and he responds, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. And doesn't that just summarise our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who lived that life, that sacrificial life of love? Is our love abounding? Is it pouring out? But is that love which is abounding from us filled with knowledge and depth of insight into the, from, from God himself? We must be filled with God's kind of love if we are to live God's kind of life.